Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Wellbeing Live, hosted by the Mental Health Center of Denver, and thanks to our presenting sponsor, Cigna. Wellbeing Live is a series of short virtual talks, workshops, and classes given by our experts from across the organization on topics to help support your well-being and the well-being of the people around you. My name is Amanda DeGruccio, and I work in the development office at the Mental Health Center of Denver. Today, we are excited to hear from Jessica Vogel, a certified health education specialist and part of our primary care team, who will talk about sleep hygiene. If you have a question during the presentation, please submit it in the Q&A chat in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. All right, and now I'm going to take it away to Jessica, our presenter. Hi, again, my name is Jessica Vogel, and I'm a certified health education specialist. Um, and what that actually means um, as a health educator, um, I take information and um, present it to um, a general population um, so we can better make um, decisions about our health um, and overall well-being. So I'm not a pharmacist, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse or nutritionist, um, I'm just a general health educator. So I just want to clarify that before we begin. Um, so today we're going to be talking about sleep hygiene and I'm sure that that um, brings up a lot of questions of what is sleep hygiene? So let's go ahead and learn about it. Go to the next slide. Um, so when we think about hygiene, we think about um, showering daily, brushing our teeth, combing our hair, changing our clothes. Um, so things that we do to take care of our, our body. Um, and that is exactly what sleep hygiene is. It's taking care of our sleep. So it's a variety of different practices and habits that are necessary to have good nighttime sleep quality and full time, full daytime alertness. So part of day sleep hygiene is learning about the stages of sleep. There are four stages of sleep in addition to rapid eye mu movement or REM sleep. The stage one is a light sleep where you drift in and out of sleep and can be awakened easily. In this stage, eyes move slowly and muscle activity slows. This is also the stage that when you start to, your eyes start to get a little heavy and you might start nodding off and then all of a sudden you have this like jerk reaction. Um, that's sudden muscle contractions um, preceded by a sensation of falling. Moving to stage two, the eye movement stops and brain waves become slower with an occasional burst of rapid brain waves. So again, the body's starting to slow down, but you're, you're getting these sudden bursts of, of brain activity. The body begins to prepare for a deep sleep and body temperature begins to drop and the heart rate slows. So stage three starts to move into that deep sleep. Um, in stage three, extremely slow brain waves called delta waves are interspread uh, inter with small, faster waves. This is the deep sleep. During this stage that a person may ex experience sleepwalking or night terrors, talking during one sleep or bedwetting. These behaviors are known as parasomnias. Whenever you hear the word somnia, that's attached to sleep. Um, and these parasomnias tend to occur during the transition between non-REM and REM, REM sleep. Again, REM is that rapid eye movement. Moving into stage four, this is the deep sleep continues as brain waves produce delta waves almost exclusively. When people are aroused from this state, they often feel disoriented for a few minutes and it takes takes a minute to kind of figure out, wait, where am I? What, what time of day it is? Um, and so this is, again, that deep sleep stage. And then the last stage of sleep is rapid eye movement. This is what we commonly think of when we think of sleep. And this is most commonly the dream stage. Brain waves mimic activity during the waking state. The eyes remain closed, but more rapid from side to side, 
and it's perhaps related to an intense dream and brain activity that occurs during this stage. So when we put all these stages together, we create what we call a sleep cycle. Um, so what are sleep cycles? A uh, sleep cycle refers to the period of time it takes for an individual to progress through the stages of sleep. One doesn't go from a deep sleep into REM sleep or light sleep. Uh, rather, sleep start cycle progresses through the stages of non-REM from light to deep and then reverses back to deep to light, ending its time in REM sleep and then starting all over again. So a, a typical sleep cycle could look similar to, if you're looking at the screen, stage one into stage two, into stage three, that deep sleep, back to stage two, back to stage one, and then REM sleep. Um, we might not always hit stage four. Um, we may spend a little bit more time in stage three. Um, but typically that's that's how a cycle uh, moves along throughout um, the night. After REM sleep, an individual returns to stage one of light sleep and begins a new cycle. As the night progresses, individuals spend increasingly more time in REM sleep and correspondingly less time in a deep sleep. So probably the next question is, how long does a sleep cycle actually last? The first sleep cycle takes about 90 minutes. After that, the average is about 100 to 120 minutes. And typically an individual will go through four to five cycles per night, um, depending on how many hours you typically get in a night. It's important to note as well that these phases last for different durations at varied ages. Uh, so an infant sleep cycle will look different than that of an adult or an elderly individual. On average, you move through the stages in a sequential fashion. Most non-REM sleep occurs early in the night and the length of REM periods increase as the night goes on. So you're spending more time in that REM sleep um, and that's why there's a good chance that you'll awaken from a dream in the morning. And hopefully it's a sweet one. So how much sleep do I really need? That's always a big question. Um, everyone usually thinks when, when we, we think about sleep, how much sleep am I really getting and how much do I really need to, to, to function? Um, and I, I'm not gonna go through every single um, stage, um, but you can just see that a newborn obviously needs more sleep than a teen or an adult. Um, sleep needs vary across ages and are especially impacted by life, lifestyle, and our health too. Um, our health plays a big role in how we sleep and how much we, we need. Um, so for a typical adult, uh, 18 to 60 years of age, seven or more hours is, is pretty standard. Um, so when you hear that eight hours of sleep a night, um, sometimes that's really hard to achieve. Um, you know, some people can go on six hours. Um, some people really need nine hours. Um, and it's really kind of determining what is best for you. Um, so these are just kind of the, the general recommendations. So how can we improve our sleep? That's really what sleep hygiene comes down to. One of the most important sleep hygiene practices is to spend appropriate amount of time asleep in bed, not too little, not too excessive. So it's it's really comes down to not falling asleep on the couch and then waking up and then heading up to the bedroom to go to sleep. Um, that really kind of can disrupt our sleep-wake cycle. Um, so moving through some of these, um, limiting your daytime naps to 30 minutes. It's okay to nap. We, we all enjoy a little cat nap here and there. Um, but making sure that 
that it's a short nap, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, it can help improve our mood, alertness, and performance. Napping doesn't make up for inadequate nighttime sleep. Um, and that's really important to know. Um, it's more that you're just kind of improving that mood, alertness, and performance. Avoiding stimulants such as caffeine and nicotine close to bedtime. If we wanna to go to sleep, we don't want something to be waking our systems up. Um, so really avoiding that uh, close to bedtime. Some people can't have caffeine after 1 p.m. or, or there's that, that five o'clock p.m. group that, that loves to have a cup of coffee. And sometimes that works for people and some, some people it doesn't work for. So it's really kind of determining what works for you is how much caffeine or, or nicotine you can have. And when it comes to alcohol, moderation is key. While alcohol is well known to help you fall asleep faster, too much close to, to bedtime can disrupt sleep in the second half of the night as the body begins to produce, uh, process the alcohol. Exercising definitely can promote good quality sleep. As little as 10 minutes of aerobic exercise, and aerobic exercise is when we, we're getting our heart rate up um, or elevated, um, such as walking or cycling, can drastically improve nighttime sleep quality. Not quantity, but quality. For the best night's sleep, most people should avoid strenuous workouts close to bedtime. And I want to point out um, that it's most people. Um, some people, the effect of intense nighttime exercise um, works well for them. Um, and so that can differ from person to person. So it's really finding out what works best for you as, as opposed to your, your exercise cycle. So the next two are, are gonna be really important in um, improving our sleep hygiene and our, our quality of sleep. Establishing a regular routine bedtime, I'm sorry, Establishing a regular relaxing bedtime routine is going to be really important. When you were a baby, your parents probably really strive to, to get you to bed, to develop those, those healthy bedtime routines um, because we want babies to sleep. And so these are things that we want to carry out through, um, through an adult. And there's no time that is too late to start to develop a, a relaxing bedtime routine. A regular nightly routine can help the body recognize that it is actually, in fact, bedtime. This can include taking a warm shower or bath, reading a book, or doing some light stretches. When possible, try to avoid emotionally upsetting conversations and activities before attempting to sleep. Um, something that we find upsetting to us is going to um, kind of stimulate that that brainwave and that that thought process, um, and it, it's not going to be calming to us um, as we we want to move into our sleep. Making sure that the sleep environment is pleasant, mattresses and pillows should be comfortable. Um, if you need to fluff your pillows to make them a little to give them a little bit more life, if you like a, a bigger pillow, or maybe you like a flatter pillar pillow. It's really up to you to decide what what's going to work best for your 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 sleep. Um, your mattress. Um, it's good to maybe ch change, um, rotate your mattress, or flip your mattress every three to six months um, for to extend the quality um, and the life of your mattress. Um, mattresses can be expensive, and so we can't always rush out and, and buy a new mattress. So there's things that you can do to increase the quality of your mattress as well. The bedroom should be cool between 60 and 67 degrees for optimal sleep. Um, when it's too hot, it, it keeps our, our body temperature up and it makes us a little bit more restless. Bright lights from lamps and cell phones and TV screens can make it difficult to fall asleep because our mind is always going towards that light. Um, so turn off the lights or adjust them when possible. 
You can go to your settings on your phone and decrease the brightness or put a nighttime filter on it. And um, if you're someone who likes to, to check your phone before bed, um, consider using blackout curtains. These are certain curtains that have an extra layer um, that really filters out the light. If maybe your, your window lets in too much light in the morning and makes you wake earlier, um, using eye shades can help or earplugs to drown out noise. White noise machines, humidifiers, fans, and other devices can all make a bedroom more relaxing. So steering clear of foods that can be disruptive at night before sleep. Heavy or rich foods, fatty or fried meals, spicy dishes, citrus fruits, and carbonated drinks can all trigger indigestion uh, for some people. And so when we go to, to lay down at night, that's when heartburn, that painful heartburn can really um, start to set in and really disrupt our sleep. And ensuring that you have adequate exposure to natural light. This is particularly important for individuals who may not venture outside frequently. Maybe you're stuck in an office all day and you're not able to get out. Um, so exposure to that sunlight during the day, as well as darkness at night, helps maintain a healthy sleep, sleep-wake cycle. Um, so, you know, opening your blinds um, for a few minutes, um, having that exposure to natural light, um, instead of having the overhead lights, um, possibly in your, your bedroom or again, if you're, if you're in an office, taking those breaks to step outside and, and get some natural light is always gonna be beneficial. So we talked about foods that could um, not be beneficial before bedtime or, or disrupt our sleep. Um, so there are foods that can improve our sleep or that work well um, to, to promote um, healthy sleep. There are four main vitamins and minerals that can be found in food that aid in promoting sleep. Tryptophan, magnesium, calcium, and B6. Some of these substances help the body produce melatonin, which is the hormone that is responsible for regulating your sleep-wake patterns. So the first one is tryptophan. And tryptophan, we most commonly think of our Thanksgiving dinner because it's um, found in Turkey. And so after eating like a week's worth of food in one meal, you want to take a nap. And it's probably because you just ate a lot of food, but it's also because of that tryptophan. Um, it really in, um, helps to promote um, sleep. Um, and so there is some foods that, um, and again, I'm, I'm not going to read through every, every food, um, but when we think of tryptophan, we, we typically think of the turkey, um, but it's found in other foods as well. Magnesium um, is a big one. Magnesium is a natural relaxant that helps deactivate adrenaline. So when we're all pumped up, having a magnesium to kind of calm us down. Um, so again, that, that's gonna be something that really helps set in um, in that nighttime snack um, to help promote sleep. Um, bananas, avocados, and yogurt, um, those are gonna be some foods that, that seem to come up a little bit more often um, that have you know, other, um, other minerals or vitamins in them as well. And the other, the last two foods, um, calcium and vitamin B. Calcium helps the brain make melatonin. Again, melatonin is that hormone that helps regulate that sleep-wake cycle. And then vitamin B helps convert tryptophan into melatonin. The deficiency in, in B6 is also linked to symptoms of depression and mood disorders, which can lead to insomnia. Insomnia is when we're not sleeping. Um, and so we're awake throughout the evening or throughout the night. Um, and again, some of those foods that are coming up um, on these lists that were on other lists, bananas, avocados, dark leafy greens, um, yogurt, um, 
nuts. Um, so a lot of just different varieties of foods that you can have for that late night snack. Um, that's not going to really fill us up um, or irritate us that can help help promote that healthy sleep. And so how does sleep, we're talking about food, how does sleep affect our weight? Um, sleeping poorly or not enough can slow the body's metabolism. Metabolism is the process by which the body converts calories to energy. Research suggests that Poor sleep makes the body's metabolism work less effectively. Doesn't necessarily slow it, it just is not working as effectively and leaves more unexpended energy to be stored in the body as fat. Poor and insufficient sleep makes the body inclined to store calories as fat. Research indicates that poor sleep can trigger the body to make more insulin and cortisol. Higher insulin and cortisol levels appear to prompt the body to store energy as fat, especially in the abdomen, so that, that belly fat. Poor sleep can increase appetite. So not getting enough sleep or sleeping poorly leads to changes in hormones that regulate hunger and feeling of fullness. Um, so when we're, when we're not sleeping well or we're, sleeping, um, we're not sleeping enough, um, there's, there's hormonal changes that are occurring and we're, we're not feeling the way that we should be. And hunger is also, is often a result of that. And so we start to make poor food choices because we, we feel so hungry and we start to have those cravings. And so while sleeping not enough or poorly can, can be hurtful, sleeping too much can be, can be harmful as well. Research suggests that there's a link between too much sleep and weight gain. As with too little sleep, there's a greater risk of obesity among people who sleep too much. Um, there's also um, a variety of health problems that have been linked to too much sleep. Some of those um, health concerns include problems with cognition and so how we're thinking throughout the day. Um, and also including memory problems, depression, anxiety, and other mood problems. Increased inflammation in the body has been linked with oversleeping, which ultimately leads to more body pain. And oversleeping can be linked to an increased risk for heart disease and stroke. So finding that, that happy medium. And as I said in the beginning, I, I'm not a, pharma, a pharmacist. Um, and so this section of going over medications, there are certain medications that can help you either fall asleep faster or stay asleep longer. Um, but it's always best to talk to your healthcare provider about what, what may work best for you. Um, there are prescription medications. Um, some of those um, prescription medications that we might be a little bit more familiar with, um, Ativan or Xanax or Valium, um, some of the things that you see on TV, uh, some of the more brand names, um, Sonata or Ambien or Lunesta. Um, those are, are, are more of those sleep aids. Um, and then certain antidepressants and antipsychotics can also um, help with the aid of sleep um, that work with insomnia. But again, it's always best to talk to your healthcare provider um, if you have a concern with your sleep um, in getting some type of prescription sleep aid. There's also things that you can buy, medications that you can buy over the counter at your local Walgreens or, or other pharmacy, um, grocery store pharmacy. Um, melatonin can come in a supplement. Um, you can get that again at a pharmacy or a natural health store. Um, some of the common names that we think of when we think of melatonin, Midnight or Sleep 3 or Pure Z's. Um, other over-the-counter medications that help with sleep, Benadryl or ZQ, um, and combined with Unisim or Simple Sleep. And then herbal products, um, Valiant Root or Kava or Camomile tea 
Um, that's something really common that people always suggest is having just a, a cup of chamomile tea before, before bedtime, maybe as you read a book or listen to some soft music to kind of calm your system. But again, if there's, if there's a concern with your sleep, um, always talking to your healthcare provider is going to be um, the best step in, in finding what works for you as far as a medication. If you wanted more information about um, sleep hygiene and uh, just sleep in general, um, there's a lot of different um, sleep disorders and conditions. Um, the sleepfoundation.org is a great site to go to um, just to look through and, and see if there's anything else that can improve your quality of sleep. That pretty much wraps up um, talking about sleep hygiene, I think we had um, a couple questions that may have come through um, that I would be happy to answer. Um, how can I tell if I have a sleep disorder like sleep apnea? That is a really great question. Um, sleep apnea, and I, I didn't talk too much about disorders um, because there's there's so many disorders um, that can fall under under sleep, um, but sleep apnea is a common disorder um, that um, it's a, a very heavy snoring um, where you actually stop breathing for for a sh short period of time, a few seconds, um, and so finding if you have something. Um, like sleep apnea or another sleeping disorder is really going to be an assessment of how are you feeling during the day? Um, do, you, do you feel groggy throughout your day? Um, do you have trouble falling asleep and waking? Are you waking up um, several times throughout the night? And so if, if you're really thinking about these things, it's a good idea to talk to your healthcare provider of what can you do? Um, maybe you would get a sleep study or there's um, breathing machines that you can wear at night that maybe aren't very comfortable, but if you're you're needing to get maybe more oxygen at night. Um, but again, starting with your healthcare provider is always gonna be the, the first step. Another question, thoughts on pillows. Is there a particular type that tends to work best. When it comes to pillows, because I've asked this question several times, um, it really comes down to personal preference. Um, pillow, you can use pillows in multiple ways, not just to support your head, but to support other parts of your body as well. Um, maybe you don't want to sleep on your back and using a pillow to support your back you maybe would want a firmer pillow um but it really comes down to the type of pillow that you prefer um if you want a firmer pillow um or a fluffier pillow maybe you need to give your pillow a little life um, but one of the best things to do is just try them out go to a store that has different pillows feel them and um, you know, they're in plastic covering, so, um, you know, it's it's um, safe, but just putting your head on the pillow and seeing if if the firmness of it is, is something that works for you. And sometimes it just comes down to trial and error. Um, but having a good pillow is, is certainly gonna be key to a good night's sleep as well. And it looks like that may be all the questions that we have. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for attending and listening. And I hope you didn't go into that first stage of light sleep and started nodding off. I hope you, this gained your attention and um, I hope that you have a better night's sleep tonight. So sweet dreams, thank you. Thank you, Jessica, uh, for leading us through such an engaging session on sleep hygiene. I know I learned a lot and um, definitely want to consider how I fall asleep tonight and what I do to prepare for that. Um, so thank you also to everyone for tuning in today for the latest edition of Wellbeing Live. Please share this with your network, friends, family, um, the series, as well as um, knowing that this video will be available and recorded. Um, 
So you can find that on our Wellbeing Live webpage at a later date. And we encourage you to share this if you found it interesting. If you fill out the form on our webpage, mhcd.org backslash Wellbeing Live, um, you can be notified of upcoming Wellbeing Live events and you can submit more questions and topics for us to consider. We look forward to having you join us for the next Wellbeing Live.